You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN, and now TSPN presents Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Good morning. Welcome to Love, Hope, and Faith with me, Heather Murdoch, and I'm delighted to join, the, join you this morning, and I thank you for uh, tuning in today. I have a wonderful show lined up. I have a, an author named Casey Odeland who will be on today, and uh, he has written a book about his experiences of being in prison and uh, what he has chosen to do as a result of those experiences, how he's chosen to equip uh, young people coming out of prison um, with a game plan. And uh, of course, you know my show is about Jesus and about how God transforms our lives. So of course we'll be touching on that aspect as well and, and uh, the deal that he made with God while he was in jail, in prison. So I'm really excited to uh, have Casey join me shortly. But um, it was an interesting week this week and um, kind of a parallel to the guest today talking about being in prison. I feel like I've been in prison this week and um, prison inside myself and the prison, um, the prison of fear. And I want to share that with you. Uh, I have, uh, many of you have been watching the show since it started last summer, and I'm so grateful for that. But I also have some new viewers, and I wanted to kind of backtrack a little bit and just uh, share how the show came about briefly. Uh, I have been a Christian for just a few years, maybe about three and a half years, and I have. Uh, had my life so dramatically transformed by Jesus. I mean, that's what this show is all about, and, and many of you know that. That's what I'm all about, about sharing that transformation and that hope that comes through Christ. <sighs> He's done so much in my life. I spent the majority of my life, um, I'm 41 years old, and I, I spent the majority of my life really uh, ruled by other people's opinions of me and ruled by uh, fear and doubt and worry and uh, not loving myself and um, you know I looked good on the outside I've always projected that I had everything together because uh, I'm, a, I'm a recovering perfectionist so I've, I've always played the role well but um, due to a very dysfunctional childhood I spend a lot of years hiding a lot of guilt and shame and uh, based my self-esteem based my my happiness and we know happiness is fleeting anyway, but I was basing my happiness on, on uh, other people's opinions of me and chronically consumed with uh, worry about what others thought of me. And, uh, and all I can say is that since I've found Jesus and, and have that close relationship with him, I have found not happiness, which is fleeting, like I said, but true joy and contentment in wherever, in whatever circumstance I'm in and I'm just so grateful to him and that's what the show is all about. It's about um, not only me sharing that but my guest showing that as well. <coughs> that whatever the circumstances are you're in, when you have a relationship with Jesus, there's a, there's a complete wholeness that you will never know unless you have that. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful to talk about that. I, as I said, I, I've been recovering um, you know, recovering from, from, from myself, I guess you could say, from life since being a believer. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, Sue Slavik, who owns a station here, I had been volunteering on the AM live show in the mornings uh, over the last few years off and on. And one day, about a year and a half ago, or maybe longer now, uh, Sue talked to me about hosting a spiritual show. And, you know, of course my ears pricked up at the thought of having my own show and being able to, to you know, have, have that uh, sounded fun and exciting. And, you know, I have to admit, it sounded great. But when she asked me, I, I really paused and really uh, listened to God. And I, and I really didn't feel like I, it was time for me to do something like that. And I want to make sure I'm so... Uh, conscious of and desiring of really letting God lead my life and not running ahead of him and what he has in store for me and the plan he has for my life and so I actually didn't talk to anyone about it I didn't say yes to Sue I uh, kind of just kept putting it off and uh, didn't even talk to my husband about it for about a year I would pray periodically to God and, and, and I would say to God you know God if this is of you I'll know it and I don't want to do it if it's not of you. And uh, about a year after that first initial conversation, uh, Sue brought it to my attention again, and I, it was like the green lights just went on. And I, I just knew that God wanted me to do this. And so uh, you know, I told Sue, one of the things that, that 
one of the biggest, the biggest thing for me is that if I'm going to do a show, it has to be about Jesus because that's who I am. That's what I'm about, and that's what I'm passionate about. And um, and that's you know because having a spiritual show could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people but for me it's Jesus and, and that's my truth and and so she was gracious in that and she said okay and that was how love hope and faith was born I really feel it's a, a God-given opportunity and I'm just so grateful for it and so blessed and as the show has progressed people have encouraged me to start a YouTube channel and you know it sounded great yeah the opportunity to reach more people I mean we know how YouTube can be it can either go nowhere or it can go big and and you know I, I've toyed with that idea before but we really never followed through with it because um, it just seemed really overwhelming and kind of scary to be honest with you well last week and here we're getting to the part about my being imprisoned by fear this week last week I find out that you that TSPN TV has gone YouTube not just my show, but all the shows on TSPN TV have now, there's a TSPN TV channel on YouTube. And uh, you would think that maybe I would have been excited about that. No, I was actually terrified. I, I'm not kidding, I was terrified. I, I, I watched the last week's show and um, the only thing I could think about when I was watching it is, oh my gosh more people are going to be watching this. I am scared. What if what if people start criticizing me? I mean, as you know, if you I mean, if you've watched the show prior, you know that I'm very open about my life and about my struggles and about my walk with the Lord. I'm very open about the poor choices I've made in my life. I'm very open about the the depression that I've struggled with in my life. I'm very open about the eating disorder that I had that God delivered me from. That I had for almost for almost 18 years. I'm very open about uh, my mistakes and things I learned, the revelations God gives me. I'm very open about uh, about who I am in Christ and encouraging people. I mean, I'm bold. You know that. I'm very bold about about Jesus and passionate about what he can do in your life and and the guests I have on are very transparent and vulnerable and they share. And I talk about uh, the fact that I'm in Celebrate Recovery and and what an amazing program that is at the Nazarene Church and and I have pastors on my show and 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 people who have struggled and people who have been transformed by Christ and we're all just really real. I am not trained to be a talk show host. Um, I'm not a professional speaker. I'm just me. And and I'm I'm just I'm just honored and blessed to have this opportunity so when I watched the show and I thought oh my gosh it's gonna be on YouTube and all of a sudden the world started seeping into my mind and all these thoughts doubts worries and fears about oh my gosh people what if people judge me what if people criticize the show what if they criticize what I say what if I don't say something theologically absolutely correct I'm not a pastor I'm not an expert you know what if what if um, people don't like the way I look honestly as a woman who has lived the majority of my life worrying, obsessing over, over what people thought of me. This is a big thing. God is really testing me. I, I look at the show and I don't like the way I look, you know, and, and, and I'm, I am critical sometimes, but always, always I've been able to just say, Heather, it's not about you. It's about Him. It's about Jesus. It's about God. It's about who He is and what He's done in my life. And whatever people think of the show, I've always been okay with that as long as I'm honoring God. Um, but this YouTube thing really put me in a tailspin. It really, like, all the old doubts and fears came flooding back. And I, and I told God, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. I don't want that kind of pressure. Um, God, please take it away. I actually prayed. I actually told my husband, I don't want to do this show anymore. I don't want that kind of pressure. I don't want that kind of exposure. Um, I, I, I can't take it. God, I'm not ready for this. And um, my husband was really encouraging and said, why would you give up an opportunity to, to talk about God? And I said, I don't know. I just, it feels really uncomfortable. You know, I, I don't want that kind of exposure. I feel very vulnerable. And uh, I went to this, you guys, I, I cried. I, I, was, I was just terrified, honestly. I had chest pain <laughs> over worrying about being on YouTube. <sighs> The next morning, every morning I read my Bible. I share that with my viewers. Um, I read my Bible every day, mostly every day. And, uh, and uh, I've been reading lately in Daniel because our church just did uh, the, the Babylon, which is the study of Daniel. And so I've been in the, in the Word of Daniel for the past several weeks. And, um, and uh, that day, the next morning after finding out about, you, finding out about YouTube, I, um, 
I just felt like I needed to read somewhere else, and I left Daniel, and I was led to Acts. God, I knew that God was leading me to read Acts, and I should have marked it here. Um, so I just happened to stumble upon... I'm thinking, where was I last reading in Acts weeks ago? And I thought, well, maybe it's in Acts 17 or 18. And I just automatically went to Acts 18. And I have to share with you what God had for me. This is the morning after obsessing and worrying and crying and asking God to take the show from me. And this is what I read, the very first scripture that I read that morning, the next morning. Randomly, right? It's Acts 18, 9 through 11. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, for I am with... No, I'm sorry. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack you and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. That was what God had for me that very next morning in a, in a, in a book in the Bible that I have not been reading, and I knew, you guys, I wept. I wept with the intimacy of that moment, I wept with just what faithfulness he has to just talk to me through his word. And I just felt so uplifted and inspired and filled with purpose. And I know that I let the world and people's uh, opinions of me come to my mind and, and, and fill my heart. But you know what? God's purpose is what's written in my heart. And I'm just honored to be able to be here with you and be able to bring you these amazing guests who have had their lives transformed, who are doing good, who are helping others and making a difference. And I'm so grateful. And today I, I have, I have, I'm, ba I'm back to my big faith. I'm back to my, um, to feeling bold in, in what I do in the show. And whatever God chooses to do with it is His plan. And I'm, and I'm okay with that. And I'm thrilled. So I can't wait to come back from break with uh, Casey Odland. We'll be right back. watching your local television network TSPN and now back to Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Back. Welcome back and I'm here with Casey Odlin. Hi Casey. Hey Heather. Good How to are have you? you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure having you. And you've written a book um, and it's called The Ex-Con and the Italian Princess. I don't know if you can tighten in on that shot there, Alan. Um, but I love, I love the name of the book. How'd you come <laughs> up with that? Well, what it was is um, after getting out of prison in 1980, I always hid from the ex-con part just to blend back into society, which I was able to do. And then the Italian princess is actually, it took me until age 49 to meet my princess, so to speak. Uh -huh. And I met her on eHarmony. And it's cool. uh, the love of my life, best love ever. Aww. And uh, we were in Sutter Creek over the last weekend and walking across the street and uh, this one outdoor band that plays on the main street, they do karaoke, and they were playing Etta James, you know, at last. Oh, yeah, I love And that. we just started dancing on the sidewalk. Aww. Nobody else was dancing. And as we walked away, these ladies go, I'm glad to see romance is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that long, longingly. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah. her incorporation into the book is late in the book because what inmates want to focus on when they get out of prison is getting a job yeah. and getting on with their life. And so there's just a little bit of the mushy mushy, but it's late in the book. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to share the story about how you and I met. Um, mm -hmm. I had been told about you by my mother-in-law. She works mm -hmm. at the uh, at the uh, she runs a liter literacy program at the county library here. Right. And so you had been working with the library to come in and, and, and speak and, and, and right. start sharing your book. And so she called me and said, oh my gosh, you've got to have this guy on your show. And <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah. So she directed me to your website and I checked out your story there. And um, mm -hmm. she was very, you know, I trust her judgment and she was mm -hmm. very excited that you would be on. And you and I had a conversation, a very frank conversation because, right. you know, I've talked to you about the fact that my show, um, I love to show stories of trans transformation and, and mm -hmm. people doing good with experiences that may have been hurtful or hard right. and to do good with those experiences and, yeah. and that's awesome but also my show is about about God and how God is in that and how God uh, uh, uses our experiences for his good for mm -hmm. his plan his perfect plan and so I, I just told you, you know, I said, I really want to pull out, if that's true for you, I want to pull out that part of your story. Right. And you shared with me an awesome story in response to that about how, how you, how your relationship with God and how he's a part of this. So let's talk about that first, and then yeah, we'll uh, kind of backtrack again and, and oh, sure, get up to sure, the book. Sure. You know, when I was in prison, um, it was about a little over a year into my sentence, and inside of me it's just, 
I was taking a change for the better, so to speak. I could feel it, and I and I fought it because I'd so for so long between age 12 and 22, I was just, you know, more than half that time I was incarcerated. And uh, but that I would actually be cussing myself out in the mirror, and my buddies would go, "What are you doing?" I go, oh, "It's an internal thing." <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, but then it had to do with God. But when I grew up, I started out, you know, uh, Protestant, so to speak. But so I you were raised in a Christian home. Is right. that fair to say? Okay. Well, Christian mom. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> and, that's uh, that's da common. Dad wouldn't go to church, but mm -hmm. he'd drive us there. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that funny? You hear that quite a bit, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, but anyway, I finally just told God, so to speak, and that's, I guess, the term you could put it in, told God. <laughs> I says, if you, if you get me out of here alive, uh, you know, I'll go to church. And then the next thing was is um, I added on to that. I says, well, if you get me out of here, you know, I'll go to church, but I want to find a woman and start a family, and that's what I want. And so when I got out of prison, I, I told myself ahead of time, I'm going to take a whole year um, off to just work, get a car, get a place to stay, and then I'll date. Mm -hmm. And then I started to date, and it's funny, the first three gals that I dated, they were all Catholic. And I went to church with all three of them. It was over about a three-week or one-month period. And the third one was probably the best one, you know, woman that I'd ever been with, so to speak. And I said, well, maybe let's give this a go. And um, we went through the six-month process of, you know, going through the Catholic courses and everything like that. And then I was uh, baptized. And uh, let's see, I got my first communion, confirmation, baptism. Yeah. And my godparents kind of knew of my past. So when that was happening, they go, okay, everybody duck when the Father does that because <laughs> evil spirits are going to be flying everywhere. Yeah. And, and and they ducked. <laughs> Everybody was okay, though. What, what, let me just stop you there. What did the priest say about your background, about your past? Uh, I'm not Catholic, so I'm curious right. what a Catholic the, the, priest would say. The, the interesting and the, and the nice thing about the Catholics, I guess you could say, is that they're all forgiving. Yes. And so it really doesn't matter what happened previously. So mm -hmm. no matter how much I wanted to say, well, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and he goes, doesn't matter. He goes, you're here now. Yes, that's good. Amen. You know, so was, uh, mm -hmm. that was a good thing right there for me. I felt yes. welcomed because of that. That's great. That's yeah. As it should be. That's right. what, that's who Jesus is. Yeah. 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 So, okay, so then you, um, so then you, you told me you went online to research. Oh, well, what it was is back then it was 1981 and there was no online, so I had to go to the um, San Francisco Public Library. Okay. And uh, so I went there and um, looked through their records and only 11% of the population was Catholic. And here within a three-week period, I'd seen Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. And I figured, well, maybe that's my sign. That's where I should go. Right, okay. And, Interesting. you know, for a number of years, for over 20 years, and still somewhat to this day, you know, that was a good way to go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you, so you ended up starting a Bible study, and you got more involved with your Catholic church. Right, well, what it is, I joined the Knights of Columbus. Uh, tell me what that is, because I, I wasn't, I didn't well, know what okay. that was. Well, that's okay. The Knights of Columbus has over 1.6 million members worldwide. Mm -hmm. And so what it is, is they're a Catholic fraternal men's group, and they form a corporation in each area where they are. I, I believe Calaveras County in Amador County has a you know Knights of Columbus located in a regular church. Okay. And what they do is they provide uh, scholarships and um, you know repair the roof on the church type of thing. Okay. They're usually the bulwark of the church, mm -hmm. and it's all volunteer. Um, it's like a men's ministry sort yeah, of yeah. like. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a little looser than that because they usually sell most of the beer in the county wherever oh, they are. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Okay. Um, so we had the yeah. the dream machines, which was a bunch of cars that would come in, and then we had the air show, and we'd sell 25, 30 kegs of beer, make you know oh four gosh. or five thousand dollars net profit off of these kind of things. And I was telling them I was you know because I was kind of getting more and more into the faith, and I says you know we're selling way too much beer. I go why don't we do something else? And they go okay what? You know, here's a thousand bucks. What? I go, okay, let me go find something. And, and I said, it's a Bible because I grew up Protestant and the Bible was very important. Exactly. And in the early 1990s, the Catholics were kind of sliding back a little bit and they said, hey, wait a second, there's this Bible thing. You know, they're, wow. they're hooked into the seven sacraments, which is really good, so to speak, but they never really played with the Bible because it right. wasn't to their liking. So what they yeah. did is they uh, wrote the New American Bible. 
you mm -hmm. know, their version. Everybody has their version. And um, oh, that's a Catholic. The New American is a Catholic. Is a Catholic oh, I didn't Bible. Realize that. Okay. That's theirs. And so what happened was, is that I found a perfect Bible because in Half Moon Bay, where I lived and I was raising my family, is nobody has any time for mm -hmm. their kids or anything. It's job, job, beach, job, ocean, job. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, you would open it up and it would have the first story of the Bible, a picture of it. Okay. And then it would have one page of reading. Mm -hmm. And so I set that up that way so that the parents could at least sit down and you know, spend that couple of minutes with the child. Yeah. And then when I was in um, third grade in Connecticut, you know, you, you watched ever since you were like four years old. And in third grade, you'd get a Bible with your name on it in silver mm -hmm. embossed letters. So yeah. I wanted to do that for these um, Catholic kids, so to speak, when they were eight years old going to First Communion. And so I put everybody's name, the date, the time, you know, they got their First Communion. And we passed them out. And the kids loved them. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I was in the local Safeway, a kid would come up and, you know, tap on me and say, I'm reading my Bible. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. So it was really a neat thing. That is awesome. Well, you know, in the, the God, you know, Jesus says, you know, um, don't be a, stum a stumbling block to children's faith, you right. know, to their relationship. And so it was awesome you were, you know, empowering the kids to have that to yeah. have that Bible knowledge. Well, I mean, I don't know if this is a, uh, an appropriate question, but I wonder, do you know why the Catholics aren't, and maybe they're more so now, but mm -hmm. my, my understanding, I go to Bible study our church, and mm -hmm. there would be a lot of Catholic women at our Bible study, which right. is open to anyone, because right. um, they didn't offer the Bible study at their church. Why is that? Well, what it is is different churches have different um, uh, leanings as far as what they like to do. Like uh, you can come in here to the Central Valley into a Catholic church, and they'll have the Ten Commandments right out in front of the church, mm -hmm. okay? And so, you know, they're very pro you know, have the baby, no abortion and everything. You right. go into San Francisco Bay Area in the Catholic Church and they almost actually hide that and they really? never talk about they never talk about abortion because what would happen is they would be turning away half Alien of the people, people. That, mm -hmm. that are coming in and, and that's their actual out of their mouth. That's that saying, Hey, if we did that, you know, we'd lose, you know, half the congregation. Wow. Whereas in the Central Valley they say, We don't care, you know, if you're gonna do that we're going to be mad at you. You know, you can make it up, but we're going to be mad at you in the Bay Area. It's like, you know, well, she, 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 you know, yeah. so it, it all depends. And um, the Bible studies in like a, um, a Baptist environment or a uh, um, Protestant environment or something like that is going to be a lot more heartfelt meaning Applying because, there's a, lo life. because yeah. there's a lot of years involved, a lot of centuries involved of that kind of, uh, of studying the Bible and being able to, you know, to work with it, and the Catholics are kind of brand new working with okay, the Bible, okay, and so sense. it's just it, they're just kind of searching. So, so some of the, the priest is the one who has more of the Bible knowledge and kind of interprets it or translates it to the to the congregation. Well, the, the priest has his seminary knowledge mm -hmm. and then his practice. You know, they they go for ten years mm -hmm. and then they become a father and then they have to go practice somewhere. So yeah, the, they'll yeah. send them in as an associate yeah. uh, priest somewhere, and then they'll either get good or they won't. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but uh, right now the Catholics are importing a lot of priests, and they have been for a long time from Africa and South America because in this country... Like missionaries? It, yeah, in Catholic. this country, you know, the Irish and the Italians would have, you know, we'd have eight, nine kids, and one or two of them would become a sister or a priest, and that's mm -hmm. not happening anymore. Yeah, yeah. So now they have to import. I just can't imagine, you know, it's it just interesting for me to observe that about the Bible study because I just mm -hmm. can't imagine... Um, I, I honestly, Casey, mm. I, I bring my Bible with mm. me everywhere I go. Mm. It's always in the car. I never mm. leave home without it. Kind of like yeah, American Express. <laughs> you know, because I just, I love it so much. I love yeah. to read it. Well, that's why the Catholic ladies are there, because they're getting more out of your Bible study mm -hmm. than they might even have one where they are, but it's just not very good. Yeah, And yeah. they'll bring that knowledge back and... You know, use it against you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully for good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, good. Well, I definitely do want to get to your book. Thank you for sharing that story. Okay. I want to get to the heart of, of what your book's about and, okay. and, um, and what it's doing and how it's affecting other people's lives. So okay. we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. And we're coming back, and we're back. Okay, so Casey, tell me, do you mind, will you share how you got into prison? Or oh, sure, sure, sure. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when I was about seven or eight years old, I started smoking cigarettes, and by um, by then I was, you know, petty thievery and things like that. Mm -hmm. And from 12 until 17, I was a ward of the court, which meant the state of California was my mom and my dad. So anytime I went in front of a judge, and the judge in Yolo County was Judge 
Roach. So, you know, yeah. so, and he was one of those uh, hanging type of a judges. So he was always sending me to, you know, youth authority or uh, foster care or group home or, uh, you know, some kind of juvenile detention or another foster home. And by the time I was um, 18 or so, I was a pretty good criminal. I mean, I wasn't getting, I was getting arrested, but I wasn't getting convicted because I knew the ropes by then. But then I was down in um, Bishop, California, and I caught a robbery down there of a gas station. Nobody got hurt, but I mean, I got caught. I got ID'd. And uh, the judge gave me uh, three years in prison. And so it was two years in prison and then one on parole and then never arrested again. But I was lucky because the current governor, Governor Brown, the year before in 1977, had changed the sentencing law from, uh, like I would have got 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I would have had to go to the parole board. Yeah. Okay, and he changed it to indeterminate sentencing which was two years, three years, four years. Mm -hmm. So if it was like a robbery with a gun, that would have been four years. Yeah. Or if it was just a strong arm robbery, it might have been two years. But I was just on the in-between. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd robbed an establishment, you know, three years. And so two years in, and then one on parole. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So I had to, to take you back a little bit, though, here. How does a seven or eight-year-old start smoking cigarettes? How does that happen? Well, the, 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 the climate at the time, a little different from when you might have grown up a little after me, so to speak, mm -hmm. is... Uh, um, everybody smokes cigarettes in the 50s, 60s. I mean, right. everybody smokes. So, dad smoked Marlboros, mom smoked Salem. So, I could go and kipe one, you know, 20 in a pack. Nobody's going to miss that one cigarette. Yeah. And the first time I tried to smoke, it was so funny. I, was, I lit the cigarette and I was blowing out on the cigarette. And I was like, nothing's happening here. And so, I went back down and watched the dad and watched him, you know, yeah. suck in. I go, that's how you do it. So, anyway, I went back up in the bathroom lit the cigarette, sucked in, and coughed for about a minute and a half. <laughs> wow, that is a powerful illust illustration, what you just said. That is yeah. a powerful yeah. uh, imagery and illustration of how our kids model our behavior. Right, right. Yeah, if you smoke or you drink a lot or you fight a lot, you know, it's not so much that they're going to model that, but that's already in their genes and chromosomes. Mm -hmm. It's already in their way of life, and you're just helping them to go, oh, that's the way to go. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Also, what did, your, did it break your parents' heart that you went into prison, that you chose that life? What was their reaction? Well, they, they tried for a while to beat it out of me, and then that didn't seem to work, and then they tried to... Uh, physiatry, or as they say, psychiatry, the miracle oh. of psychiatry. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, um, I know, you know, it's just like the worst kids on the block was the, the minister's kid, the cop's kid, yes. and the doctor's kid, yep. and so mm -hmm. I was just one of those mischievous uh, kids. Mm -hmm. And so they got to a point to where they gave up when I was 12, so to speak, and that's when they, um, my dad, you know, earning good money as a, as, as a top doc, so to speak, he didn't want to lose all of his assets because I burned down the neighborhood or something like that. So, so you were more like a liability. I was a liability. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they just turned it over to, you know, ward of the court. So a lot of people don't understand. It's like uh, Preston Castle's not too far from here in Ione. Right. Yes. And uh, back Fascinating then. Fascinating history. Oh exactly. yeah. And and back then, um, if you um, shall we say in the late 1800s, early 1900s, if you um, lost your parents and it was no fault of your own, you're a child. Okay. Yeah. You might end up at Preston Castle. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't give you time back then. Everybody averaged about, I think, five years of time. They gave you 2,000 points. So if you did something good that day, they would give you a point. Okay. If you didn't eat your food, they might take away two points. I see. If you got in a fight, they'd take away ten points. And if you escaped, they would hunt you down, and they would get you, and they would bring you back, and they'd whip you pretty good. And then you get all 2,000 points back. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, you know, so the, the system changed a little bit by the time, you know, I went in. And, yeah. Uh, but it was still, it's still a pretty brutal system. But it, in a way, the system has to be kind of uh, brutal. Otherwise, people would just get their three meals a day and live in prison for free. And yeah, what do you think about, I mean, I guess there's so many things we could talk about today. I want to go too far because I want you to have a chance to talk about your book. That's the, the heart of why you're here. <laughs> but what do you, do you want to comment on what you think about um, the programs in prison now? And, and you know, there's, there's so, it's a divided, it's a divided uh, picture. You have right. people who think that, that that prisoners should be educated and right. they should have opportunity to grow and hopefully change right. and rehabilitate. And then you have the other side of the fence that says, they have more rights than we do. That's not right. They don't deserve anything. Right. Where do you sit on that? 
Well, what it is is um, I was lucky that when I went to prison that they had about 15, almost 20 different vocational trades, and I chose the office machine repair trade. Mm -hmm. And so when I got out, I got a job in 1980. In August of 1980, I had three employers competing for my services, and within three years, I had my own business, mm -hmm. which is really nice. But now, the reason I wrote the book is in 2009, I was leaving San Quentin after you know, Gary Schimmel, a nice guy up there, an instructor I've known for a while, and we're walking away and he goes, that's the last time you'll see that pre-release class. And I go, what are you talking about? And he goes, that's going to be canceled. I go, well, let's go over to the trades. And he goes, there's nothing there. And I go, oh, man. I go, you mean that, you know, they're getting out of here. They're getting 200 bucks in their hand and they're getting a good luck. Okay. And that was, I just couldn't put up with that. And then the sirens went off. And when the sirens go off at any prison, especially San Quentin, that's prelude to shooting. Mm -hmm. And um, within about three seconds, I heard the pop it a pop 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 it a pop pop coming from the central guard tower. So all the inmates were already on the ground around us, okay? And we don't have to go on the ground because now we're, you know, free people, so to speak. But when the guard tower starts shooting, you slow down a little bit. You look for ricochets because mm -hmm. the central guard tower can shoot into a number of different yards and areas. And so there's no ricochets near us. So we walked away. But I go, I got to do something about this. And that was the reason for... You know, it took another year to go, it's a book, okay? Because a lot of these books you see with a front cover like mine, it's kind of like it's a thug life, you know, book. Mm -hmm. And what my book does is it gives the inmates a road map on what to do when they get out, mm -hmm. okay, as mm -hmm. far as how to find a job, how to keep a job, how to find an apartment, how to keep an apartment. And then a couple years down the road, they can use it as a reference guide, okay, if they get in any kind of trouble with the Internal Revenue Service, with the uh, bankruptcy, with divorce, with, you know, uh, saving money. Uh, you know, I found out over a 32-year period what's the best way to do everything. And I wish I would have had this book when I got out in 1980 because by the time I was 28 and to now when I'm 54, I would probably be worth millions and millions of dollars, yeah. you know, just on that, on the, on the dollar and cents level. Mm -hmm. But as far as, you know, happiness and, you know, being able to spend, you know, a month in the Hamptons every summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could have done that. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, learning those life skills, as I like to call them, balancing mm -hmm. your checkbook and just how to get through in life. You know, the, the, we, the schools don't teach those things. Even no. if you're not incarcerated, those skills, kids have to learn them on their own. Yeah, and you they know? always learn it backwards the hard and, way. and the hard way. Maybe mistakes yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely and if those uh, you know if your parents didn't model a uh, stewardship of their resources mm -hmm. you know usually the kid doesn't learn it except for the hard way like you like you said um, so so do you think that you know um, recently there was a, an election here in our county for mm -hmm. a Superior Court judge right. and there's a lot of talk about um, you know the over the overloaded prison system right. jail systems and um, do you what do you think about uh, people coming out in the community rallying together to reabsorb these people you know it's that that's kind of what they're saying now is that we really need to start focusing on allowing the churches and the community service programs in the in the, in the community right. the village mm -hmm. to come in alongside people and, and help them to get back into the system. Yeah, Get back into yeah, the system, and, and, but and right into now life. The, yeah, and, yeah, and the best, um, uh, like a fulcrum, a starting point that I've seen, because I didn't, I came in here to, to do a different TSPN show the first time, yeah. and everything developed from that show to, you know, Hein Book Company, the radio, the library, and everything like that. And uh, basically what it is, is recently I found that the Calaveras um, Probation Office, and the Chief Probation Officer, it's Terry Hall, and she's working with these brand new programs and she's cutting her return figures, you know, people that are under her care at probation, uh, she's cutting that in half, mm -hmm. okay? So in this area, she would be a good fulcrum point if you were a church or whatnot and you said, um, I want to be involved, okay? Her office, when you go in there, I was surprised because it was like, it was old home week, you know, the, here's you have ex-offenders in there joking around with the probation people, and they're all buddies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's going on here? Because mm -hmm. usually it's just, you know, re-offend, re-offend, send them back, send them back. If they look the wrong way, send them back. And her office is doing a spectacular job, and they're still in the beginning stages, so to right. speak. Mm -hmm. But I believe she's building probably one of the most beautiful programs awesome. in this area, and I believe that the chief probation from different counties around her are starting to see that 
and I think they're wanting to know what is she doing. Okay, so Terry Hall, chief probation. I, I think she's she's, she's um, onto something. Well, she's uh, similar to Michelle Ree, who's married to the Sacramento mayor, who's what she's doing yes, for education yes. for mm -hmm, the whole mm -hmm. country, which hopefully will. I know it will work and then it will go out around the world, so to speak. But I think if you look at probation and you look at what Terry Hall is doing in Calaveras County, I think you'll see that um, she is just growing a beautiful program. I'm, I'm really, I, I'm excited about it and I hope to be um, a part of it on That's some awesome. level. That's awesome. That's so good to hear. It's encouraging. My grandfather was in prison ministry for years. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I remember before I was a believer, <clears throat> I would always you know, say, Grandpa, come on. Oh, yeah, of course these guys, he's rapists, murderers, you know, oh yeah, of course they believe in Jesus. They just want to get out early. They just want to get things easier. That's a way to get out early. Yeah, <laughs> and so, and I'd be like, Grandpa, they're taking advantage of you. Why are you even wasting your time, you know? And it's interesting how God works because now I have a desire to go in and teach Bible study to um, women right. um, in jails. I haven't right. done it yet, but it's something I feel called to do at some point in the future, and I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity if mm -hmm. it ever comes. You'll be and very rewarded if you do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I can't think of who needs more hope than someone who's in prison yeah. and who's made the mistakes and has to face that and, and they don't needs have forgiveness. To, and they don't have know. to go to the Bible study class, so to speak. Yeah. It's a voluntary thing. Yeah, exactly. And then you have a very captive audience at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but you know, I mean, and of course I do believe people do have to be held accountable to their mm -hmm. actions, right? Mm -hmm. You oh know, yeah. Oh yeah. but also given the tools to, to, um, to, to, uh, to succeed in life after. It's right. great. And I think it's great what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. So your book uh, really is your biography of your life. Yes. I wrote it after reading. I, I finally got the final pieces in place. I was reading a book called Hollywood Animal by Joe Esterhaas. And he was the one that um, did... Um, Basic Instinct with uh, Sharon, Sharon Stone, Stone and Michael yeah. Douglas, mm -hmm. and uh, and so he had a thing to where it went back to his Hungarian roots, and then it went back to where he started in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and then it kind of went through. So my book kind of starts at, you know, when I'm young, and it goes to when I started going to prison, and then it kind of goes back and forth, and then they eventually the two courses meet um, through the book, okay, and so awesome. it starts off wild. And, but then the lessons start to come in. Right, right. Good. Well, you got to paint the picture. So yeah. on that note, we're going to take a, pr a break, and we'll be right back. Casey, for being on today. It's been a pleasure. Glad to be here. It's been fun. So tell me more about, um, I want to kind of talk about what your book imparts to people. What, why should an inmate read this book? Well, what happens um, when that book goes into a prison within 48 hours to one week, it becomes the most popular piece of literature in that prison, wow. the most sought after. And people in the visiting rooms are telling their people that visit them, you know, get me that book. <laughs> and uh, But um, the thing that it does for individuals, before I get into the you know, lessons, so to speak, is I can show them empathy because they can see that no matter what they did during their juvenile or adult criminal career that, you know, I was a little bit ahead of them, so yeah, to speak, yeah. on the wild side. So you have street cred. And so, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, but I can show them empathy from the standpoint of, okay, I've been there, mm -hmm. okay, so you can understand where I'm going with this. And then as they're reading through it, they go, hey, wait a second, you know, I can do this, and it gives them hope, okay? Yeah, yeah. And then the beautiful thing is that hope turns into confidence, okay? Mm -hmm. The confidence resolve and they move forward, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. Because that's what I start to talk about when I got out of prison is I was unstoppable, okay? Anything I went after. Within three years, I had my own typewriter repair business in San Francisco. It went on to be over a $400,000 a year business. I had the San Francisco Opera, the San Francisco Symphony, the San Francisco Ballet, everything in Golden Gate Park, all the art institutes, and I took that, and I went downtown San Francisco, and I got Charles Schwab, the Federal Home Loan Banking System, AIG, when they only had $200 billion, but they were still the biggest ones on the block, big accounting firms, big law firms. So I impart that business sense as far as what I was going through. You know, how do you get all the best accounts in town? Mm -hmm. All the other office machine dealers in the whole area hated me. I, when I got the Levi Strauss account, which was about you know, 30, 40 grand a year, all 17 of the top office machine dealers in the whole area would bid against me every year. They'd go to Tahoe and have a seminar amongst themselves on how they were going to beat me out of that account. And how do you, what do you attribute that to, to um, your ability to get those great accounts? Well, one thing I did mention in there is by chance, and of course I always you know, fought, I, I have dumb luck, I guess you could say, but I had a 64 Chevy when I started my business. And the clients at the opera would see me drive up in that. <laughs> okay? yeah. And they'd go, you know, how are we going to trust this guy with a $4,000 check every year if he drives some old dumpy car? 
And so I kind of sensed that. They didn't say that, but I sensed that. So I came up with a delayed payment program. And I said, for the first 90 days, it's 90 days free, okay? And then I'll bill you on day 90, net due 30, and it'll be due on the 120th day. So you as a purchasing agent, if you take a chance on me, okay, and I get into a flaming wreck in downtown San Francisco and my car burns up and I'm dead, I go, you didn't lose any money for your company. Mm-hmm. And, and what I didn't realize is I would see them get so excited about this and go in the other room and come back and they go, you got it. <laughs> yeah. And what I didn't realize is that a lot of budgets were tight when I was starting my business in the early 80s. So this delayed them spending that three or $5,000 for the year. It delayed them from spending that money initially, which was a good thing for them. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is when the next year when the company would try and get the account back that I'd bid it from, okay, they couldn't get in because the first thing that the client would do, they'd call me and they'd say, Casey, are we getting that delayed payment program again? And i go, sure, if you'd like it. And they go, thanks, you're really saving me. Yeah. So now I own these companies as I got them, so to speak, because now they're not going to plop down $5,000 if they can get me with a delayed payment program. And it took my uh, competitors five years to find out about that. Mm. And by that time, I had all the best accounts in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And they would not match me for that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that was even, you know, so I was, it was kind of a dumb luck thing. I was able to get in there financially, but at the same time, I had the best service in town. Right, right. You, so you, you could back up. You yeah, were, I was you know, always there within 24 yeah, hours. Yeah, and yeah. It you was had a good a, product. Yeah. So, okay, so you, ha- you, ha- you impart business wisdom in mm-hmm. this book. What else? Well, the business wisdom is just, you know, to, you know how to start your own business. Mm-hmm. But then uh, I give my different dating wisdom from different times in my life. And uh, so the, the last dating wisdom was when I was 49 and I had, uh, I had divorced my first wife of 24 years. And uh, it was just, you know, it was a bad situation. And so I took some time off and then I said, okay, if I'm going to go back into this dating realm again at age 49 and now I'm 54, uh, I have to do it right. And so my, my eye on the prize was eHarmony. And so I hadn't dated in a while, so I had to take some of the lower level dating sites and, you know, practice there and um, uh, build my way up, so to speak. And then eHarmony was, uh, you know, the capper on it. And uh, that's where I found the love of my life. And so what I mentioned in the book is, you know, when are you going to stop meeting, the, you know, the gals and guys at the bar, so to speak? Exactly. When are you going to think you're going to walk that. out at the supermarket and... Um, Without the psychological profiling, which they've had for about 35 or 40 years on different levels, but the modern type is really, you know, with the Internet is just so fast and quick and, you know, everything is there. And so without doing that, you don't really have the chance to find a a love of your life. Yeah. Yeah, You're not going to find it at the bar, chances are, right? (laughs) Exactly. Um, That's good. That's good. And so you you impart dating advice, business advice. And and, and, and the, the main thing I'm hearing is, like you said, it's the hope. That, yeah. that, that just because you've been incarcerated doesn't mean that you can't make something of your life after. But oh, yeah. don't you believe it comes down to choices? You oh, know, yeah, yeah. and the there's right still choices. people I see all the time as far as um, somebody will get the book and they'll be like somebody that's just from jail or something like that. And people in jail, like let's just say it's here in Amador County, okay? Mm-hmm. They know everybody in the jail. They've mm-hmm. been growing up going to juvenile hall and jail together for a long time. Mm-hmm. So, and then their parents let them stay at home, and now they're 30 or 40 or 50 years old, and they're still staying in the same room they were when they were teenagers. Okay? Yeah, yeah. They have That's no defeating. no reason to you know turn their life around. As mm-hmm. far as they're concerned, hey, if I go spend 30 or 90 days in jail right now, no big deal. I'll be back out on the street with my buddies, drinking and doing drugs and everything like that. Yeah. So, you know, not everybody hears the message. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's hard for families, you know, after families have been maybe stood by someone's side for time after time of, of continuing to make the same mistakes and families finally get fed up. Right. You know, and then and then your family turns your back. Right. Their back on you, the person, you know. And, and that's and, a uh, good thing. Yeah. So do you believe in tough love? Oh, yeah. I, as, as there's, there's women I see every week that are crying over their sons or their grandsons that are in their 20s and 30s and 40s and everything like that and I go tell me the story and so they tell me the story and I go turn away really? you know and they go oh but I can I go I know you can I go you've been enabling them the whole yes, way yes. I go until they're flat on their face and flat out I go you know until they you know like by the time I went to prison I had no family structure. I had no support structure. I mean, it was about a year or so after I got out of prison that, you know, oh, solo mio, <laughs> you know, humble, you know, went yes, back to my humble. family, mm-hmm. 
took some crap, <laughs> and, uh, but then I created a relationship. And when I had, you know, children, which were, you know, their grandchildren and everything like that, I always, you know, made plenty of availability with, you know, them and their, you know, their grandkids and everything like that, so that they could, you know, build a relationship and everything. And I believe I agree with you. I mean, I don't have a, this experience, but just my own personal opinion is, you know, you can still love them, but be tough. You yeah. don't stop loving them, but you have yeah. to let you. You can enable people right. and become the, in that codependent relationship, and it's not helping them. Yeah, well, it's just like sure. my kids. I, I as soon as they were school age, I took them out of San Francisco down to Half Moon Bay, which has 65 percent of the land mass of San Mateo County, but only three percent of the population. And I could keep a good eye on them. And the schools, you know, were not as good as you know, like a San Mateo or a San Francisco, uh, you know, like a private school could be. But the living was laid back. The ocean, you could see it from every school they went to. You could see the ocean. And we were always down at the ocean or out and about and everything like that. So they never, till 18, they never did drugs. They never did alcohol. The two daughters didn't even uh, really have a serious boyfriend until they were over 18 years old. Oh, gosh. Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> I want my daughter to never have a boyfriend. I was one of the luckiest parents ever when, <laughs> yeah. it, came, when it came yeah. to that, so Yeah, to yeah, that's good. And that's uh, good. But by 17 or 18, they were just like me. They just I was like 8 or 9, and I got all independent, and they were... They waited until they were about 17 or 18, and then boom, all out of the house, all gone, all doing their own thing. Doing their own thing, yeah. being empowered. That's good. Yeah. Well, your book, um, again, it's 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 uh, available uh, locally. Well, right downstairs at uh, Hein and Company, yeah. uh, Wolf Hein, uh, uh, he's got them down there, and at um, Sustenance Books up in Murphy's. Uh, <coughs> uh, it's up there, and then you can go to Amazon. Since we're on YouTube, we've already talked about Amazon because there's people that don't, li don't live here who'll be watching, maybe, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So it's uh, Amazon. You can get it. Yeah. It's worldwide in 145 countries. Awesome. And uh, Barnes and Noble, if you like Barnes and Noble, and yeah. it's also on eBay. And so it's it's if you Google the name or the name of the book, it'll come up in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. And since this is a Christian show, I do have to say one little thing. That there is some bad language in the book, and <laughs> but that's because it's written in the vernacular or in the in the it, way that people would talk. In yeah, in the time that I was um, at when I was writing about, so to speak. Yeah. So there's a little, little bit of potty mouth in there, but it was just um, when I was incarcerated, when people from outside would come in and talk to us, if we didn't hear a little swearing, we wouldn't trust them. You didn't them, trust them. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So it had to be a credibility thing. Right. Okay. Well, we, our interview it has come to an end, but you've been awesome. I really appreciate you, and I and I look forward to collaborating maybe in the future on things. Yeah. No. My, my, me too. Yeah. And I do read every week. I read from Jesus Calling by Sarah Young, and it's a devotional. And so mm -hmm. I would like to put to end the show with a nice little sure. uplifting devotional. So today she says, "This is Jesus talking. I speak to you continually." My nature is to communicate, though not always in words. I fling glorious sunsets across the sky, day after day after day. I speak in the faces and voices of loved ones. I caress you with a gentle breeze that refreshes and delights you. I speak softly in the depths of your spirit, where I have taken up residence. You can find me in each moment, when you have eyes that see and ears that, hear, that hear. Ask my spirit to sharpen your spiritual eyesight and hearing. I rejoice each time you discover my presence. Practice looking and listening for me during quiet intervals. Gradually, you will find me in more and more of your moments. You will seek me and find me when you seek me above all else. Very nice. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I love the way she writes. Yeah. Do you plan on re do you plan on writing any more books? Oh yeah, yeah. Good. I have. Uh, the next one is uh, the ex-con shows you how to write a book. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, well, uh, I have a great show lined up for next week, and I'm really excited to come back next week. Thank you, and do check us out on YouTube at TSPN TV, and um, we'll see you next week. Thanks.